Howdy. Howdy. Been waiting a long time to do that. I wanted to open congressional hearings that way, but... Well, it's wonderful to be back in Aggie land. I want to thank the Bush Library and Foundation and CEO Fred McClure for hosting me this morning. And I want to thank President and Mrs. Bush for being with us uh, this morning. So a word about the neck brace. Before I became Secretary of Defense, I had never had a broken bone or a surgery. Then as secretary in February 2008, I fell on the ice and broke my right arm in three places. Ten months later, I tore the bicep tendon in the left arm and had to have surgery. My security detail soon realized that Al-Qaeda was a trivial threat <laughs> to me compared to the damage I was capable of doing to myself. Tripping on a rug at home on New Year's Day uh, and fracturing my first vertebrae is the latest event in this sorry record. <laughs> so on to the book. Let me read the first two sentences of the first chapter. And I quote, I had become president of Texas A&M University in August 2002. And by October 2006, I was well into my fifth year. I was very happy there. And many, but not all, Aggies believed I was making significant improvements in nearly all aspects of the university, except football. <laughs> On November 8, 2006, just as President George W. Bush was announcing he would nominate me as Secretary of Defense. An email went out from me to the entire A&M community, and that was the email from which Fred quoted. My book, Duty, is about my subsequent four and a half years at war. It is, of course, principally about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where initial victories in both countries were squandered by mistakes, short-sightedness, and conflict in the field as well as in Washington, leading to long, brutal campaigns to avert strategic defeat. But this book is also about my political war with Congress every day I was in office, and the dramatic contrast between my public respect, bipartisanship, and calm and my private frustration, disgust, and anger. There were also political wars with the White House, often with the White House staff, occasionally with the presidents themselves, though more with President Obama than with President Bush. And finally, there was my bureaucratic war with the Department of Defense and the military services, aimed at transforming a department organized for planning for war into one that could wage war, changing the military forces we had into the military forces we needed to succeed. George W. Bush and Barack Obama were, respectively, the seventh and eighth presidents of the United States I worked for. I knew neither man when I began working for them, and they did not know me. To my astonishment, I became the only Secretary of Defense in history asked to remain in the position by a newly elected president, much less one of a different political party. I first came to the job in mid-December 2006 with the sole purpose of doing what I could to salvage the mission in Iraq from disaster. I had no idea how to do it, nor any idea of the sweeping changes I would need to make at the Pentagon to get it done. I had no idea how dramatically and how far my mission over time would expand beyond Iraq. As I look back, there is a parallel theme to my four and a half years at war, and that is love. By that I mean the love, and there is no other word for it. I came to feel for the troops 
and the overwhelming sense of personal responsibility I developed for them. So much so that it would, shame, uh, it would shape some of my most important and significant decisions and positions. Toward the end of my time in office, I could barely speak to them or about them without being overcome with emotion. Early in my fifth year, I came to believe that my de determination to protect them in the wars we were in and from new wars was clouding my judgment and diminishing my usefulness to the president and thus played a part in my decision to retire. I make no pretense that this book is a complete, much less definitive history of the period from 2006 to 2011. It is simply my personal story about being Secretary of Defense during those turbulent, difficult years. Why did I write it now and not wait until after President Obama had left office? Because the major themes of the book address issues that are important today, critical today not in 2017. How to deal with the Middle East, where Arab Spring has, been, has given way to political and security winter. Whether to attack Iran or Syria. How to deal with China. How much defense capability do we need and for what? How to reform Pentagon spending. With a polarized, paralyzed Congress is a coherent national security policy possible? Civilian military relations, including presidents and senior military. Is defense reform possible given the parochialism and self-interestedness of members of Congress? Is our national security policy too militarized? These are urgent questions for today. And with the perspective of a historian and someone who served eight presidents, I believe I have something relevant to say on each of these issues based on my experiences and observations during four and a half years as Secretary of Defense. Throughout those years, I was treated by Presidents Bush and Obama with consistent generosity, trust, and confidence. They both gave me the opportunity and honor of a lifetime in serving as secretary. With only a few exceptions, members of Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, were respectful and gracious toward me, both publicly and privately. Overall, the press coverage of me and my actions was substantive, thoughtful, and by Washington standards, positive and even gentle. In both administrations, I liked and enjoyed nearly everyone I worked with at the White House, the National Security Council, other departments and agencies, and above all, at the Department of Defense. Treated better for longer than almost anyone in a senior position I could remember during the eight presidencies in which I had served. Why did I feel like I was so constantly at war with everybody? Why was so, I so often so angry? Why did I so dislike being back in government and back in Washington? It was because despite everyone being nice to me, getting anything of consequence done in Washington was so damnably difficult even in the midst of two wars. From the bureaucratic inertia and complexity of the Pentagon to internal conflicts within the executive branch, the partisan abyss in Congress over every issue from budgets to the wars, the single-minded parochial self-interest of so many individual members of Congress, and the magnetic pull exercised by the White House and the National Security Council staff, especially in the Obama administration, to bring everything under their operational control and micromanagement, all these made every issue a source of conflict and stress. I was more than happy to fight these fights, especially on behalf of the troops and the success of their mission. At times, I relished the prospect. But over time, the broad dysfunction in Washington wore me down, especially as I tried to maintain a public posture of nonpartisan calm, reason, 
and conciliation. Every single day I was Secretary of Defense, I was at war with the Congress. In the Bush administration, my fights with Congress were mostly over Iraq troop levels, timetables and deadlines, and war budgets. When I turned my focus to the overall defense budget under President Obama, I was continuously outraged by the parochial self-interest of all but a very few members of Congress. Any defense facility or contract in their district or state, no matter how superfluous or wasteful, was sacrosanct. Every contract defended to the last breath. In addition to the rampant parochialism and self-serving behavior, my other main frustration with Congress was its failure to do its most basic job under the Constitution, appropriate money. I prepared five budgets for Congress between 2007 and 2011, and not once was a defense appropriations bill enacted before the start of a fiscal year. This dereliction of duty was dramatically disruptive of sensible and efficient management of the department. By, beyond all of this, I was exceptionally offended by the constant adversarial inquisition-like treatment of executive branch officials by most members of Congress across the political spectrum. When the television cameras are turned on in a hearing, it has the same effect on members of Congress as a full moon on werewolves. <laughs> Sharp questioning of witnesses should be expected and is entirely appropriate, but rude, insulting, belittling, bullying, and all too often highly personal attacks by members of Congress violated nearly every norm of civil behavior as they postured and acted as judge, jury, and executioner. My view of Congress while I was Secretary of Defense, uncivil, incompetent in filling basic constitutional responsibilities such as appropriations, micromanagerial, parochial, hypocritical, egotistical, thin-skinned, often putting self and re-election before country. I won broad praise from members of Congress and the press for my patience, civility, restraint, and respectful, civil, calm demeanor during hearings. And that is only because they could not know what I was actually thinking at the time. <laughs> Through all that, for four and a half years, the clenched teeth behind the smile when dealing with Congress remained well hidden. It was just another battlefield in my wars. It is difficult to imagine two more difficult, different men than George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Clearly, I had fewer issues with Bush, partly because I worked for him during the last two years of his presidency, when, with the exception of the Iraq surge, at least in national security affairs, nearly all the big decisions had been made. I did cross swords with Obama on two issues. Our disagreements on the defense budget in 2010 and 2011 were explicit often discussed face-to-face, -face, both in meetings and in private. I wanted to restructure defense spending to make it more efficient and disciplined, reducing bureaucratic overhead and waste and canceling weak programs in order to preserve and enhance military capabilities. I did not want to cut the overall budget itself, just spend it far more wisely. Obama felt that defense could and should be cut on its merits, but also to give him political space with his party and constituents to cut domestic spending and entitlements. At least that's what he told me. I never directly confronted Obama on the second issue, which was his determination that the White House tightly control every aspect of national security policy, and most significantly, operations. But I often did raise that issue with the White House Chief of Staff and the National Security Advisor. 
I had no problem with the White House driving policy. That's what presidents are supposed to do. But his staff's intrusiveness, micromanagement, and meddling in operational matters was unprecedented and drove me crazy. Both presidents were devoted to the troops and did all that could be expected to support them and their families, the wounded and the families of the fallen. But there was a significant difference between the two presidents in one respect. President Bush supported the troops and also strongly supported the missions in Iraq and Afghanistan they had been assigned to carry out. President Obama opposed the mission in Iraq and came to be skeptical of the mission in Afghanistan. I agreed with virtually all of Obama's decisions on Afghanistan from 2009 on and continued to support them even as he began to have reservations during 2010 whether the strategy would be successful. But except for one or two occasions, President Obama seemed detached from the war, failing to tell the troops why their sacrifice was necessary, why their cause was noble and just, why their mission was important enough to risk their lives. This lack of passion troubled me, and I told the White House Chief of Staff the President needed to take ownership of the Afghan war, especially after he added 60,000 troops to the effort. My personal relationship with Bush and Obama was relaxed and casual, but entirely professional. The relationship with both was close enough to allow for kidding and joking around. More than once when Obama would comment on the wide array of genuinely tough problems he was facing, I would ask him, tell me again why you wanted this job? <laughs> I witnessed both of those presidents make decisions they believed to be in the best interest of the country, regardless of the domestic political consequences, both therefore, thereby, earning my highest possible respect, respect and praise. I liked and respected both men. My time as Secretary of Defense reinforced my belief that in recent decades, American presidents, confronted with a tough problem abroad, have too often been too quick to reach for a gun, to use military force. As I say in the book, I strongly believe America must continue to fulfill its global responsibilities but we need to better appreciate that there are limits to what the United States, still by far the strongest and greatest nation on earth, can do in an often cruel and challenging world. Not every outrage, every act of aggression, every oppression, or every crisis can or should elicit an American military response. We must always be prepared and willing to use our military forces when our security, our vital interests, or those of our allies are threatened or attacked. But as I say in the book, I believe the use of military force should be the last resort and our objectives clearly and realistically defined. And presidents need to be more willing and skillful in using tools in the national security kit other than hammers. President George H.W. Bush, I think, knew how to do that. Our foreign and national security policy has become too militarized and the use of force too easy for presidents. When I was asked in October 2006 if I would be willing to serve as secretary, I said that because all those kids out there were doing their duty, I had no choice but to do mine. The troops were the reason I took the job and they became the reason I stayed. Being called the soldier's secretary because I cared so much about them was the highest compliment imaginable. The tone for my tenure as Secretary of Defense was unexpectedly set in an encounter in Washington, D.C. prior to my confirmation hearings. I was having dinner alone in a hotel dining room when a middle-aged woman came up to me and my table and asked if I were Mr. Gates, the new Secretary of Defense. I said yes, and she congratulated me and then said to me with tears in her eyes, I have two sons in Iraq. For God's sake, bring them home alive. 
Our wars suddenly became very real to me, along with the responsibility I was taking on for all those in that fight. For the first time, I was frightened that I might not be able to meet that mother's and the country's expectations. It took only a few visits to the frontline troops in Iraq and Afghanistan before I began to feel a deep emotional attachment to them, a growing feeling that I was personally responsible for each of them. I was soon telling the kids at the military academies and those on the front lines that I had come to regard them as though they were my own sons and daughters and that I would do everything in my power to get the equipment they needed to accomplish their mission and to come home safely and if wounded to ensure that they got the best care in the world. What I didn't expect was that I would have to fight the Pentagon bureaucracy itself to fulfill my pledge to those amazing young people whose selfless service and sacrifice con contrasted so vividly with so many self-serving elected and non-elected officials back home. My focus as secretary from day one was to force the Pentagon to meet the needs of the troops on the battlefield as quickly as possible, in weeks or months, not years. This would be true for the new heavily armored, mine-resistant, ambush-protected vehicles, MRAPs, and also for other major needs such as intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance, reducing medevac response times, and myriad other needs where the requests had languished in the bowels of the Pentagon or vanished altogether. There will always be a special place in my heart for all those who served on the front lines in Iraq and Afghanistan most in their 20s, some in their teens. I never imagined that I would be responsible for overseeing two wars and for seeing to the well-being of those fighting them. During World War II, General George Marshall once told his wife, I cannot afford the luxury of sentiment. Mine must be cold logic. Sentiment is for others. Icy detachment was never an option for me, because of the nature of the wars I oversaw, I could afford the luxury of sentiment, and at times, it overwhelmed me. It wasn't long before I had signed the orders deploying every single person in an American uniform to Iraq and Afghanistan. Every single soldier, Marine, airman, and sailor who was wounded in or killed was in harm's way because I sent him there. Determined never to let the fallen become statistics for me, I asked that every condolence letter I had to write be accompanied by a photo of the individual, along with hometown news stories so that I could read what his parents and brothers and sisters, coaches and preachers, spouses and friends had to say. So I could know whether he'd been an athlete or an honor student or had been aimless and found direction in the armed forces. I wanted each of them to know I wanted to know each of them as I hand wrote the condolence letter. But signing the deployment orders, visiting the hospitals, writing the condolence letters, and attending funerals at Arlington all took a growing emotional toll on me. Even thinking about the troops in private, I would lose my composure with increasing frequency. I came to believe that no one who had actually been in combat could walk away without scars, some measure of post-traumatic stress. And while the wounded troops I visited in hospitals put on a brave front for me, in my mind's eye, I could see them lying awake, alone, in the hours before dawn, confronting their pain, their broken dreams, and their shattered lives. I would wake in the night and think back to a soldier or Marine I had seen at Landstuhl or Bethesda or Walter Reed. And in my imagination, I would put myself in his hospital room and I would hold him to my chest and comfort him. Silently in the night, I wept for him. And so my answer to a young soldier's question in Afghanistan about what kept me awake at night, he did. My wars are over. For those who fought, for the wounded and their families, for the families of the fallen, 
The wars will continue for the rest of their lives. And so this book is dedicated to them. Thank you. I share your views on Congress's inability to get things done. How can this problem be fixed? What can the average citizen do to help? Maybe term limits? Vote them all out? Uh, marches, petitions, or what? I value your opinion. Well, part of the way we got here is, is historical and institutional, and therefore cannot be reversed quickly. One big factor is uh, gerrymandering or redistricting, which now means that all but 50 or 60 seats in the House of Representatives, as an example, are safe for either Republicans or Democrats. And so the election that really matters is the party primary in the spring, where the most motivated members of the party base turn out, and moderates tend not to. Uh, in both parties, and the result has been the election of a growing number of members of Congress who are more ideological uh, themselves, and therefore the caucuses have become more ideological. Another factor has been really since the mid-1970s, uh, since the Watergate Congress, has been the weakening of the power of committee chairs and the leadership in the Congress. Uh, when I first came to, to Washington in 1966, uh, the committee chairs were chosen by seniority and their, their chairs were basically inviolate. And that meant that they could take risks uh, in terms of getting things done that committee chairs elected by their caucus cannot. And so the president could get a dozen or 15 members of Congress uh, to the cabinet room and if they could agree on what needed to be done, by and large, it would get done. So I actually think that, if you will, reforms in Congress have led to its weakening as a part of our, of our government. And, and the weakness of the committee chairs has inhibited the ability to get stuff done. Then there's the 24-7 media and so on. And there are other factors as well, but the, but the one thing that I say in the book is, those things all will take time to reverse or cannot be reversed at all. But what could make a difference starting tomorrow would be if all these people just started treating each other better, if they would be more civil to one another, if they would listen to one another and actually believe that they could learn something from the other person, if they would not demonize each other, if they would not purposefully uh, distort facts uh, just in the way people behave, I think you could change the tone in Washington in a fairly significant way and in a fairly short period of time. There are those who believe that historically there has often been great tension between the State Department and the Defense Department over the conduct of foreign policy in various administrations. Did you often encounter such differences under Presidents Bush and Obama, and if so, how did you and your team try to mitigate them with the State Department? Well, enmity between state and defense were pretty common, was pretty common during most of my career. I mean, uh, as President Bush will remember, uh, Secretary of State George Shultz and Secretary of Defense Cap Weinberger were hardly even on speaking terms. And that was more characteristic than not for most of my career. I will say it was an exception under the first President Bush with Dick Cheney and Jim Baker who got along fine. It was obviously a problem in the first uh, uh, term of, president, of second President Bush, but the truth is I got along great with Condi Rice when I became secretary, and I think part of it was my view that, that I didn't have to be out front as the spokesperson for American foreign policy. That's the role of the Secretary of State. And it didn't hurt anything that I publicly called for more resources for the State Department and, uh, and for uh, development, so for both development and diplomacy. But I got along very well with uh, Secretary Rice and then, uh, to my surprise, frankly, uh, got along equally well with Hillary Clinton. And so our departments uh, were very closely attuned and I think worked very well together. It's, you know, I, I will share a secret with you. When I was four and a half years, I was president of Texas A&M, I never once got invited to talk to a political science course. 
Vegas? And I'm, and I'm convinced, <laughs> and I'm convinced it was because somehow, secretly, the faculty knew that I would tell the kids to throw out their textbooks. <laughs> that, in fact, what makes government work is relationships among people, whether it's the Congress and the President or within the executive branch. It's how people get along and work together or not that makes government work. The other thing that I had was a certain perspective. One of the beauties of being the Secretary of Defense is you never have to elbow your way to the table. You have all the money and all the troops and all the guns. <laughs> and nothing can be done without the participation of the Department of Defense. So you don't have to be out there elbowing your way and being sharp elbowed about things. You just do your job. Well, since they wouldn't let you in the political science class, I'll go to this next question. Will you accept an offer to be president of A&M again? <laughs> well, somehow, I suspect that that offer would not be forthcoming. <laughs> and second, uh, Really good second acts are pretty rare. As Secretary of Defense, what is your assessment of uh, the security at the uh, Russia or Sochi Winter Olympics? Well, you know, I've been out of government, um, um, so I don't, I'm not aware of any of the, other than what I read, papers and so on, of, of the security measures that have been taken and, and so on. I know it doesn't surprise me in the least that the Russians don't want any help. Uh, I would be, on the other hand, I'd be surprised if we weren't doing a lot in terms of sharing intelligence with them, whatever we have and whatever, and maybe they're sharing with us to try and make people safe. Uh, Putin's entire reputation seems to rest on the success of these Sochi Olymp Olympics, and so my impression is Sochi's going to look like an armed camp uh, for, uh, for the period of the Olympics. You have this group uh, from cent um, uh, Central Asia that, is, uh, that has declared their intention to attack the games. And you know we were worried about the same thing going back to 1984 and the Olympics in Los Angeles. Security at these events is always a big concern. And, uh, but it seems to me that uh, the Russians are deploying about half their army uh, to Sochi to make it safe. Uh, don't be surprised if you read about a lot of bank robberies in Moscow or something. Because you know, <laughs> uh, everybody's going to be in Sochi. Um, but, you know, I mean, th that's really about all I can, uh, can offer. Bob, talk a little bit about our time at the White House when we had the opportunity to work for 41 and the changes uh, that were taking place, uh, particularly in that part of the world uh, during those four years that uh, we had the yeah. chance to work with him? Well, I'm, I wrote this in, the, in my first book on five presidents and how they won the Cold War. And I say it often in speeches that there is no, during, during President George H.W.'s Bush, George H.W. Bush's time in office, Beginning almost immediately, we had the liberation of Eastern Europe, the reunification of Germany, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. And, and I remind people, there is, no, there is no precedent in history for a major empire to collapse without a major war. And I think only now, is 41 beginning to get the credit he deserves for having managed all of that with barely a shot being fired. And I go back, I go back to what I said about personal relationships. I think, I think one of the things that started the ball rolling in Eastern Europe, if you will, was when the president visited Poland and at the U.S. Embassy hosted a lunch that brought together Lech Walesa 
and General Jaruzelski. The President's ability to bring people together, to have conversations with Mikhail Gorbachev uh, and all of these other leaders and, and you know, empathize with them, to support them, but gently move them in the direction we wanted them to go, gently but firmly, uh, I, think, I think played an enormous role in the historic events that took place between 1989 and, and 1991. As I, as I put it in the first book, he greased the skids on which communism was slid from power. <laughs> to whom would you attribute giving you your moral values in life with a comment, we thank you for not wavering? <laughs> um, well, my parents, and I talk about this a little bit in the book at the very beginning. Um, my father was a wholesale automotive parts uh, salesman. Uh, and we, I grew up in a very modest uh, middle class home. And our lives revolved around family, school, church, and Boy Scouts. And uh, my father was a man of unwavering integrity. In fact, I can remember as a child sitting with him in church and he'd point out one or another elder and he'd say, you know, that guy is a big shot in the church, but he's really a crook. <laughs> and, and, and he's a very dishonest businessman. <laughs> and, and my father, for my father, when I was growing up, I mean, I, my brother and I were always getting into trouble. We were on a first name basis at several hospital emergency wards. <laughs> Nothing new here. Uh, <laughs> But, but no matter what we did, uh, there was one certainty in life. If we lied about it, the punishment would be three, three X. And uh, so I think, I think certainly my father, but I would also say uh, my scoutmasters. So have you had a chance to watch any Aggie foot? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Have you had a chance to watch any Aggie football the past couple of years, and what do you think of our Heisman Trophy winner, Johnny Manziel? Well, you know, I, I, uh, Texas A&M football was a source of great stress for me. <laughs> and I once, I once Enjoy turned, the crowd. <laughs> I once turned to Becky and I said, when I was still here, I said, I've been the director of the CIA. Why does why does Aggie football cause me more anxiety than anything I have ever done? <laughs> and, with, and with the wisdom born of many years of marriage, she said, it's because you have no control. <laughs> <laughs> so when I would sit up there in the president's box, I would, I would tell Sharon Riley, okay, Becky sits on one side of me, and be sure and put somebody on the other side who doesn't care if I don't say a word to him the entire game. Uh, so I have sort of watched, I still have trouble watching A&M football because of the stress, uh, but I dive in and out, and uh, Becky watches every second, and it's obviously been amazing. I will admit uh, that I was worried when A&M joined the SEC, but has just done amazingly well, and is so competitive, not just in football, but in so many other sports as well, and so that's been very gratifying. The last couple of years obviously have been very exciting for anybody who cares about Aggie football. Um, and I think we're all just kind of holding our breath to see what happens next. Four decades is a long time, uh, but getting every major foreign policy decision wrong over four decades. I tried, I, I kind of thought back to our four years there and was like, ooh, really? Uh, I think you know where I'm going with that question. <laughs> well, um, first of all, I have to say, as I say in the book, uh, that I, I like Joe Biden. He's a nice guy. He's a man of integrity. He's a stand-up guy. If you ever got into trouble, uh, he'd, he'd be somebody that'd be there for you. 
And the truth is we actually agreed on some things during the Obama administration. Although I will tell you that on one, one occasion I was riding back to the Pentagon after a White House meeting and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and I usually rode together and Admiral Mullen turned to me at one point and he said, you realize you agreed with the Vice President this morning. <laughs> and I kind of smiled and I said, yes, I'm reassessing my position. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I mean, he voted against, it was a big part of our withdrawal from Vietnam was an aid package, a uh, uh, multi-billion dollar aid package that the Congress voted down thereby leaving our erstwhile ally even more in the lurch. And, uh, and as a senator, Biden voted against that. He voted against every element of President Reagan's defense buildup, the B-1, the B-2, the MX, and more, and his whole strategy for dealing with the Soviets. Uh, he voted against the first Gulf War. And as I've said on some of the national media, I rest my case. So how did you approach being Secretary of Defense different from your predecessors? Well, I, uh, I guess first of all, and, and it, you know, I mean, it's, you always build on what the person before you and the persons before you do, whether you're President of Texas A&M or Secretary of Defense or President of the United States. Um, I, I think that I mean, what, what was different for me was that every single day I was secretary, unlike, unlike virtually any of my predecessors, every single day I was secretary of defense, America was at war. And we were in war in two places. And when I became secretary, we were losing both wars. And, and so I think that there was, a, there was a pressure there in terms of how to get it right, both get the strategy right and then get the right equipment uh, into the theater that just became a huge priority for me. I think I also uh, probably was more focused on <clears throat> enforcing accountability uh, than uh, a number of my predecessors. Fired uh, after the Walter Reed scandal, I fired the commander of the hospital, the Surgeon General of the Army, and the Secretary of the Army. And in the latter case, I didn't fire him because he didn't know about the problem. I fired him because once he knew about the problem, he didn't take it seriously enough. Similarly, you've been reading the last week or two about problems in the nuclear Air Force. And in 2008, I fired both the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force for uh, uh, their failure to take those problems seriously. Uh, I fired the head of the F-35 program because of the cost overruns and delays. Um, so I wasn't afraid to, while I was not a table pounder or a shouter or anybody else, anything like that, in fact, when I get angry, I get very quiet. Um, I, it, in terms of getting done what I needed, what I thought needed to be done in the uh, Defense Department during war, Firing some people had a very salutary effect. <laughs> what was your favorite part of this most recent book? Well, I think, you know, this, this was an issue I had with my editor. Uh, I think uh, writing about the interactions with the troops. I mean, it was the best part of the job for me. And, and he thought I went on and on and on about it a little too much. But so that took, took a pencil to some of that. But, but I think the best part for me, the part of the book that I enjoyed the most, just like the job, part of the job I enjoyed the most, were the interactions with the troops. This is kind of a linear question, but I'll go for it anyway. Uh, what, what one memory sticks out from your time working for President George H. W. Bush? Funny or serious, you can go either way. Oh, well, there are plenty of both. I know. <laughs> uh, um, well, the serious one was in the lead up to um, first Gulf War. And we had 200 and some thousand. This was in, at the end of October 2000, or in the, in the end of October 1990. And we already had more than 200,000 troops in Saudi Arabia. And 
And the military was pretty happy to just sit in Saudi Arabia and, <coughs> and protect Saudi Arabia. But the president kept asking kind of, when, when am I going to get the plan to liberate Kuwait? Which is why we got into this in the first place. And, and you know, just delay after delay after delay from the Pentagon. And finally, he pushed it hard enough that uh, we got that briefing, and it was by uh, General Schwarzkopf's number two. And we're in the Situation Room, and it's the President, the Vice President, Secretary Baker, Secretary Cheney, Brent Scowcroft, myself, uh, and probably John Sununu and, and Vice President Quayle. And this guy gave this briefing. And, and the, way that, the way that the military tries to avoid getting involved in conflict, and I saw this happen under President Reagan, uh, with respect to Libya is that anything you want to do, they basically scale up so it looks a lot like D-Day. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what the military was trying to do to President Bush that day. So the guy comes in and he says, well, first, first we're going to need the Seventh Corps. Um, and that meant taking the two heaviest divisions in the United States Army which were deployed in Germany, where they'd been since 1945, <laughs> taking all those green tanks and painting them tan, and moving them from Germany to Saudi Arabia. And second, we're going to need six carrier battle groups. And third, now this is a week before midterm elections, third, you're going to have to activate the Guard and Reserve. And to the day I die, I'll never forget George H.W. Bush standing up, looking at Dick Cheney, and saying, you've got it. Let me know if you need more, and walking out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> After the president had left, Dick turned to Brent Scowcroft and said, does he know what he just ordered? And Brent smiled and he says, he knows perfectly well what he just ordered. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are so lucky to have had for our inaugural speaker of the George Bush Distinguished Authors Series, one of our own, the Honorable Bob Gates.